News of the Times Wicked Wednesdays Notorious Cases of Family Annihilations Welcome to News of the Times. In history, what was regarded as one of the worst types of murders possible was the murderous destruction of a family bloodline. In today's episode, we look at three stories of family annihilation where all members of the family were destroyed. Thomas Austin, always in need of money, has run through his healthy inheritance and that of his wife. Thomas attempts fraud, moves up to robbery, and then graduates to murder, eventually slaying nine family members in 1694. Our second story is 1866 in Germany and finds Tim Thod irritated by members of his family with whom he notoriously does not get along. The brutal slaying of all members of his family as well as a servant girl is discovered despite his attempts to hide his crimes. A last story takes place in 1909. Jealous Samuel Atherley, who sleeps with a razor under his pillow, is told to leave the premises of his common-law wife, Mathilda Lambert. He does not take the news well. Three stories of murdering their family is today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We very much hope you enjoy the show. Thomas Austin, 1694, murder of his wife, aunt and seven children. We start this episode with a case from the Newgate calendar from 1694. Thomas Austin, although left relatively well off by his parents, goes through all his money, then his wife's money, then mortgages his estate as far as he can. As he desperately searches for funds, he takes to fraud, robbery, and eventual serial murder. From the Newgate calendar, Thomas Austin was born at Columpton in Devonshire of very honest parents who, at their death, left him a farm of their own, worth about £80 per annum, worth approximately over £25,000 a year today which is a pretty estate in that country, and as his land was without encumbrances, and he had good character at the time, he soon got a wife with a suitable fortune, she having no less than £800 to her portion. But this increases of his riches, and the thought of having so much ready money by him made him neglect the improvement of his living and take to an idle extravagant course by means of which, in less than four years' time, he had consumed all that his wife had brought to him and mortgaged his own estate. Being now reduced to pinching circumstances and not knowing which way to turn himself for a livelihood, the devil so far got the upper hand of him as to excite him to the commission of all manners of unlawful actions for the support of himself and his family. Several frauds he was detected in, which his neighbours were so good as to forgive out of respect to his family and to what he had once been. At last he was so desperate as to venture on the highway, where, assaulting Sir Zachary Wilmot on the road between Wellington and Taunton Dean, that unfortunate gentleman was murdered by him for making some attempts to save his money. The booty he got from Sir Zachary was forty-six guineas and a silver-hilted sword, with which he got home undiscovered and unsuspected. This did not, however, last him long, for he followed his old riotous course. When it was all spent, he pretended a visit to an uncle of his who lived at about a mile from his own habitation, and it was one of the bloodiest visits that ever was made. When he came to the house, he found nobody at home but his aunt and five small children. 
whom informed him that his uncle was gone out on business and would not be home till evening and desired him to stay a little and keep them company. He seemingly consented to stay, but had not sat many minutes before he snatched up a hatchet that was at hand and cleaved the skull of his aunt in two, after which he cut the throats of all the children and laid the dead bodies in a heap, all weltering in their gore. Then he went upstairs and robbed the house of sixty pounds. He made all the haste he could to go home to his wife, who, perceiving some drops of blood on his clothes, asked him how they came there. "'You bitch,' says he, "'I'll soon show you how the manner of it,' pulling at the same time the bloody razor which he had before used out of his pocket and cutting her throat from ear to ear. When he had gone thus far to complete the tragedy, he ripped out the bowels of his own two children, the elder of whom was not yet three years of age. Scarcely had he finished all his butcheries before his uncle, whom he had been to visit, came accidentally to pay him the same compliment on the way home. When entering the house and beholding the horrid spectacle, he was almost thunderstruck with the sight, though as yet he little thought the same tragedy had been acted on all his own family too, as he soon after fatally found. What he saw, however, was enough to point out the offender whom he immediately laid hold of and carried him before a magistrate who sent him to Exeter jail. In the month of August 1694, this inhuman wretch suffered the punishment provided by the law, which appears much too mild for such a black, unnatural monster. Austin suffered death for his atrocities, and continued sullen and hardened an extraordinary manner. In August 1694 this inhuman wretch was hanged. He seemed quite insensible as to the wickedness of his acts, as well as to the senselessness of them, and there can be little doubt that he was a victim to homicidal madness. When on the scaffold, when asked by the chaplain if he had anything to say before he died, only this was his reply. I see yonder a woman with some curds and whey, and I wish I could have a pennyworth of them before I am hanged, as I don't know when I shall next see any again. Tim Thode, 1866, Murder of His Mother, Father, Four Brothers, sister, and a servant girl. In our next story, it is 1866 in Holstein in Germany. Although stories from France would cross the channel frequently, stories from Germany were more rare. Johann Thode owns a farm which he runs with his wife, Margaretha, and his children. The household includes five sons and a daughter. The second son, Tim, 23, was on bad terms with his father and most of his brothers. A fire takes place at the farm and Tim rushes to the neighbours asking for help. Help arrives quickly, too quickly for Tim, and the fire is put out faster than expected. Within the partially burnt barn, the villagers are horrified to find the brutally murdered remains of Tim's parents four brothers and their servant. Police detectives are called, initially expecting that the deaths were caused by a gang of robbers, but nothing seems to have been stolen. Villagers were aware of the animosity between Tim and members of his family. Police applied pressure to Tim, and he confessed, outlying in detail how he had carried off the multiple murders of his family. This story made the English newspapers due to the absolutely horrific nature of the crimes. We are trusting in the translation being given in the paper.
From the Illustrated Police News, 29th of February, 1868. Horrible tragedy. Murder of a whole family. The following account of the murder of eight persons is translated from a German paper on February the 2nd. An unheard of crime was perpetrated in August last year in Gross Kampoin Schweizig Holstein. Tim Thode, a peasant's son, 23 years of age, murdered with unequalled barbarity his whole household, his parents, his four brothers, his sister, and a maidservant. Tim Thode's confession, made without a sign of repentance, gives full explanation of the motive for and the mode of carrying into execution of the crime. The accused, Tim Thode, related he had been on an unfriendly footing with his brothers, Johann, Martin and Cornelius. His relations also with his father had not been of the best kind. As regarding the rest of the family, he thought they were middling. In the spring of 1866, he took the resolution to kill his family in order to put an end to the continual disputing then to sell the farm which would come to him after their death, and this to come into the sole possession of a considerable fortune. The thought of accomplishing the deed occurred to him repeatedly. The thought of accomplishing the deed occurred to him repeatedly. He busied himself, therefore, not exclusively with the plan of action, but thought only now and then of its possibility. The plan of killing them one after the other in their beds he gave up, as he was afraid the noise resulting from, from what it might awaken the rest, and he would not arrive at the wished-for result. On the 6th of August he had already laid ready to hand a five-foot-long handspike to kill his brothers with. He stated, I would decoy them one after another into the barn and then strike them dead there. This intention was not carried out into execution, as he did not succeed in executing the plan in the way related. On Tuesday the 7th of August, his parents left home with a neighbour, Schwarzkopf, in order to pay a visit to some acquaintances. Tim Thode easily managed to go behind his brothers, Martin, Cornelius and Remier, one at a time as they were engaged in work, and then struck the brothers one after the other from behind with the five-foot handspike, which was thick at the lower end. Martin falls first by his brother's murderous hand, then Remier and then Cornelius. He strikes Johann over the head, this one staggers to and fro and cries to his brothers. The murderer, Tim Thode, brandishes the handspike anew and then strikes him dead. Now, the father must be disposed of. Tim, by telling him the oxen had broken loose, gets him to come out before the front door and strikes him down in the front of the farmyard. He brings the remains of his father back to the house in a cart and removes the stains of blood by digging up the earth which he throws into the cart as well. Two watchful dogs are in the courtyard of Johann Thode. These might prove dangerous to the murderer, therefore he must dispose of them. The dogs are attached to him. He entices them, places a knot around the throat of the first, and hangs him up. Thereupon he calls upon the other dog. The animal obeys his call. With the razor he attempts to cut his throat. He does not quite succeed, and howling, the dog extricates itself from the hands of the murderer. The mother appears with a lighted candle at the door and asks the reason of the noise. It's nothing, maintained Tim. Now follows the account of the terrible combat in the small room between sister and brother. The mother lies on the floor, stunned by a blow from the hatchet. The sister springs out of bed in order to save the mother. 
he strikes out at the sister and strikes her head with a hatchet. The mother still groans, he strikes her dead also. Finally, he runs to the servant girl's room, feels about in the darkness for the head end of the bed, strikes upon it twice with the hatchet, and the murder is accomplished. The girl dies without a word. There, I have them all dead, are his words. He then sets fire to the farm to conceal the deed and places the corpses in such a way that they must be destroyed at the breaking out of the fire. The conflagration was nevertheless discovered too early and led, besides other facts, to, d to so many grounds of suspicion against Thode that he himself, in the course of the examination, was driven to confess. Tim Thode, lately brought to trial, was condemned to death. The condemned man left the court with complacent placidity. Tim Thode told his story to the police matter-of-factly, and he seemed to be unaffected by the murder and brutality involved. The primary reason, according to him, was his dislike for his father and brothers and his wish to have the property and goods all to himself. Tim was convicted of all the murders and sentenced to death, and he was executed on the 13th of May, 1868. Samuel Atherley, 1909, Murder of His Wife and Three Children We end this episode of Family Annihilations with the story of Samuel Atherley. Atherley is a highly jealous man and is certain that Matilda Lambert, 27, his common-law wife, is having affairs behind his back. His jealousy extends to the point where he questions the parentage of one of his children. The couple were known to row and could regularly be heard by the neighbours. On July the 10th, Thomas Marriott hears a rap at a window as he is passing. Cautiously, he peeps through the window, and there, here he sees Samuel Atherley bleeding. His throat had been cut. Marriott enters the house and goes upstairs. There he finds the wife, Mathilda, with her throat cut. She is dead. Marriott's horror intensifies as he finds the bodies of the three children, John, eight, Annie, five, and Samuel, two. All of the bodies had knife wounds. Annie and Samuel, the two youngest children, had also been beaten with a hammer. On the way to the hospital, Atherley confessed to having killed his family at 3 a.m. in the morning. From the Sheffield Evening Telegraph, the 31st of July, 1909. Four murders, a ghastly confession, razors and hammer. The adjourned inquiry into the deaths of Matilda Lambert and her three children, John, Annie and Samuel, who were murdered at Arnold near Nottingham on July the 10th, was held yesterday at Arnold. Samuel Atherley, the man who is in custody on the charge of causing their deaths, had sufficiently recovered from his own self-inflicted injuries to be able to leave the Nottingham General Hospital for Bagthorpe Jail on Thursday, but he declined to attend yesterday's proceedings. A Neighbour's Story A neighbour of the prisoner named Mrs Howe gave evidence as to Atherley and Lambert with whom he lived, having words the night before the tragedy and to the frequent quarrels they had. Matilda Lambert, on the Friday night, told Atherley that he would have to go. Matilda also had told the witness about Atherley sleeping with a razor under his pillow. Mrs Howe, the neighbour, assisted to lay the bodies out, and in moving the bed found a hammer with blood on the handle, and a razor was also found at the end of the bed on the floor. 
Atherley always seemed kind to the two younger children who were his own, but he was a brute to the eldest boy who was afraid of him. Jealousy John Watson, the brother-in-law of Matilda, spoke of the time that Matilda had left Atherley and then gone back to him and referred to his jealous disposition. Another neighbour, Annie Ryan, testified to Atherley's threatening what he would do if he heard of Matilda going with another man. Ryan said that many of the people in the village had heard the deceased, Matilda Lambert, complain of Atherley sleeping with a razor under his pillow, but they did not mention the matter to the police, as Matilda had begged them not to do so, as Atherley had promised to sell his furniture and go. The Discovery P.C. Lowe of the Notts County Constabulary, who was called to the house after the tragedy, said he had found Atherley sitting in the living room with his throat cut, and upstairs the woman and the girl in one bed and the two boys in the other, all with their throat cut and lifeless. He produced a broken razor handed to him by the man Marriott, who was the first to discover the tragedy, and a piece of the razor blade was found in the dead woman's throat. The Confession The most important evidence was given by P.C. Lomas, who took Atherley to the hospital. Directly they started in the cab, Atherley remarked, I thought I was going to get lynched. He then said, This is just through jealousy. Atherley repeated the words several times and further said, I kill them at about three o'clock in the morning. I broke the razor over them. I then fetched another razor to do myself, which I afterwards threw at the back of the bed. Later, he added, I lay f lingering there until I wrapped the window to marry it. Atherley also gave the constable the ages of all the children and the woman and asked P.C. Lomas to tell his, Atherley's father, that he was to have the whole of the furniture except the bed, that being the property of the woman. Medical evidence was given as to the nature of the wounds in the murdered woman and the children's throats and upon their heads. The jury, after barely a minute's deliberation, returned a verdict of willful murder against Atherley. Atherley was executed on the 14th of December at Nottingham. His execution by Pierpont was said to be instantaneous. The newspapers had little to say about his execution or any demonstrations of remorse on his end. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, Notorious Cases of Family Annihilations. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe. Our goal is 1,000 subscribers, and with the fantastic support of our wonderful News of the Times community, we are making great progress towards that goal. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories of a similar theme such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.